Plato's Cave is produced by Muckraker Media. You can find out more at muckrakermedia.org. Welcome to Plato's Cave. I'm Jordan Myers, and today we're going to take another step towards exiting the cave by speaking with Dr. Patrick Lee Miller. Dr. Patrick is a, an associate professor and director of undergraduate studies at Duquesne University. His expertise is in ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, Platonism, Freud and psychoanalysis, and Nietzsche. He also has his own podcast called Living Wisdom, which is excellent, and I highly, highly recommend it. Um, for this episode, uh, we broke down two episodes of Black Mirror, which is a great show. I've discussed it before. Um, we discussed the entire history of you and be right back. And this was a pretty long conversation, one of the longest um, for Plato's Cave, for sure. And it was a really, really interesting, really fun talk. Um, and so with that introduction, uh, here is my chat with Dr. Patrick Lee Miller. Okay, cool. So uh, yeah, I'll have I'll have introduced you. Um, you know, I'll do it after this, and then and then splice it in before. Um, but Patrick, thanks for doing this. First of all, my pleasure. Cool. So we're gonna jump right into it. We're gonna be talking about uh, two episodes of the show Black Mirror, uh, which is a fantastic show. If anyone uh, who's listening hasn't watched it, um, it's I think they've done five seasons at this point, right? Is it yes, four or five? That's right, five seasons. With yeah. A couple of special- along the way that's true that's true um it's a great show it's done it's done uh, i think the creator is this guy named charlie booker who i think has a little background in philosophy if i'm not mistaken is it really i didn't know that his name's charlie brooker with an r uh, not, not to be <laughs> well, confused from the senator with the senator from new jersey that's right maybe that's why that that name was in my head um so yeah brooker um excuse me charlie and um, and yeah, I think he has a little bit of, of background in philosophy, which makes a lot of sense because each of each of the episodes are like a, uh, you know, a lecture in different philosophical problems. Um, yeah. They're really great. Yeah, I would agree with that, except to say that it, they don't come off as lectures. I mean, they're, they're highly well, entertaining. <laughs> of course, of course. But uh, yes, they, they each correspond to a, a distinct set of philosophical ideas. I agree. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're going to go over two of those um, kind of separately and also in conjunction with each other. We're going to do the entire history of you and be right back, which are uh, two episodes from season one and two, I believe. Okay. Uh, so, so let's, I'm going to start with um, the entire history of you. Cause I think it's the, the, the chronologically the first one. So I'll go over the plot and kind of, as we're going over it, um, if questions arise, um, feel free, you know, Patrick to jump in. Um, and then of course we've got questions to kind of go over afterwards, um, that tie into both episodes. So, okay. We kind of open with this main character named Liam and we get an introduction to him. You know, he's in this kind of lawyer interview. It's, it's unclear of whether he's, I guess he's working for a firm and they're sort of going over his performance. Um, and you know, he kind of takes a, a taxi and he arrives late to this house party that's going on. And when he's in the taxi, you get this, you know, introduction of the technology that, that vitiates the episode, mm-hmm. uh, which is called a grain. It's basically this, you know, implemented de- or implanted device um, kind of in the back of your neck. And it allows you to record uh, and then play back your entire history, the entire history of you, which is, you know, where the episode title comes from. Yeah. And he, he, you know, is reviewing the interview on the taxi ride over and you can see, you know, how this, this works. You know, you can go back and just see anything that you've seen, basically, you can rewatch. And, um, and he arrives to this house party a little bit neurotic, but, you know, we can't really tell if it's due to the interview or due to maybe the effects of the machine itself. And he arrives and meets his wife, whose name is Fee, and this other guy named Jonas, um, there's these you can, uh, immediate tensions that arise. You can tell something's kind of off. And, uh, and the dinner party continues. And there's, there's one woman there, uh, Helen, who doesn't have a grain, which is very interesting. Uh, her grain was stolen. She was attacked. And, you know, there's like a scar. And, um, and then she acclimated and began to like not having it. And there's kind of, you know, tensions around that. People not understanding how that could be the case. Um, and so there's an interesting analog to a cell phone there that's pretty transparent. Um, you know, people, people these days going back to a flip phone. I see. Um, 
which I, I just thought was very interesting because there's been a push back in that direction. Yes. Um, and I feel, I feel a lot of that pull myself, to be honest. Yes. Um, so, so the dinner party ends and uh, Fee and Liam go home. Um, you know, but there's kind of this weird exchange with, with this Jonas character and, and Liam has been asking about him all night. Like, who is this guy? How do you know him? Um, and, and they almost kind of hung out after the dinner, but, but Liam shut it down and, uh, and they get home and Liam immediately begins reviewing, uh, the, the interview, uh, and the party and discussing Jonas, like, you know, kind of grilling his wife fee about all the details of, of things. And they get back um, and review the daughter's night. They have a daughter. Um, you know, they just they fast forward through her entire night, which is an interesting kind of violation of, of the child's privacy there. Um, you know, maybe not when she was young, but as she gets older, very clearly so. Yes. Which, has, and, yeah. which relates to other episodes, Archangel especially, where mm. children get this Archangel yeah. implant that allows their parents to see the world through their eyes and supervise them. Mm -hmm. That's a great as episode too. Disastrously as of course he does in Black Mirror. As every episode tends to, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so so they uh, so that you know they bring up um, you know they they get into a fight about Jonas basically the the timeline of their relationship between Fee and Jonas and the details of it you know all of the emotions kind of come up and. They're kind of, they, it's funny because they go into lawyerly mode where, you know, they're bringing up memories from their grains and arguing over the details of the timelines and they're bringing up evidence and mm -hmm. it's this very kind of lawyerly debate between a husband and wife. Um, and, and, you know, this introduces that you can also erase memories, which is interesting. Yes. More or less permanently. Um, I guess permanently in some cases, depending on your settings. Uh, so they, you know, they make up... Um, and they, they, you know, have sex that night. But what's interesting is that both of them are using the grains, you know, during sex, they're not facing each other to watch, presumably, uh, I, well, I guess it actually, <clears throat> it explicitly shows it kind of uh, hotter times in the beginning of their own relationship, yes. which is, it's very interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> so, and also interesting that they're, if I recall, and you're corroborating this, that they're watching scenes of themselves having sex rather than watching scenes of being, having sex with somebody else. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't take it to be that, but I guess it. I guess it. It's not clear whether they're watching. You're right. I mean, well, the the point of view, I guess, from their own memory would have to be of the other person. But it's weird that the cutting of the camera doesn't actually show you who's watching what. Um, oh, I see. Yeah, I, I wonder I if you it can well enough to remember. But it's just surprising to me, you know, now that you mention it, mm -hmm. that she's not fantasizing about Jonas. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is interesting. I mean, they're, yeah, it's it's funny because they're not even. I mean, they're they're watching memories of the same person they're having you know sex with now, which is very strange. Um, which would also make sense in as much as their relationship has become stale. And mm -hmm. then, they're each remembering if, if that's the case, they're each remembering True. when their when their memories were better. I slipped just a moment ago when I said it's surprising they're not fantasizing about having sex with somebody else because they're not fantasizing. They're watching films mm. effectively that <laughs> purport to be accurate records of their actual experiences. And we can get into this uh, when you finish summarizing the plot, but this is a presupposition of several Black Mirror episodes, but explicitly this one that what memory is, is like a, a video recording. That what we do when we remember is we just take snapshots or moving images of our perceptions and then we store them in files. Mm. Which I don't of think course, memory works that way. Sure, I think it, yeah. it works well dramatically and I also think it, it fits with prejudices we have about how our minds work, but I, I don't think it actually works that way. Mm -hmm. And there's a ton of, uh, of, of evidence done by many psychologists that show that it's very clearly not that way, um, that we, you know, confabulate and make up memories and such. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of, it, it tables a lot of very interesting discussions about memory. Um, yes. This one and the next episode. Um, but yeah, so just to wrap up the plot, he, um, you know, like I said, he spends the night after they make up, um, 
drinking and going over the memories and and you can see he's kind of going down this wormhole and he's even using the technology to uh to to read lips of um of his wife and Jonas uh you know as he's arriving to the party he sees what they were talking about mm-hmm. and it's this real um invasion of sort of everyone's privacy it's it's very it's kind of a very uncomfortable uh set of scenes um and you know the ba- yeah sure if I may just so I don't forget things along the way because you're saying sure. of course you're summarizing the plot but you're also hmm. alluding to interesting features I just want to make sure that we don't forget them so well, while hmm. I can remember one thing you said earlier is they have a lawyerly argument hmm. he is a lawyer it seems <laughs> that's uh, true I don't, think, I don't think that she is and he takes on a prosecutorial mode throughout the episode and I think that says interesting things not just about his profession but about his character which presumably is why he was drawn to that profession he's a jealous man and Mm. jealousy makes an excellent prosecution (laughs) yeah yes very much so not necessarily an excellent way to discover the truth Mm. and so that ties to the point that i wanted to make based on what you had just mentioned which is that he goes down that wormhole of examining his quote memories going through the evidence from the evening but he's doing it in order to prove something. Mm. He's not doing it in order to investigate the truth. I don't think we, we can debate that. But that in his effort to prove things, he's looking for snippets of evidence, snippets of conversation that will make his point, which mm. is very different from trying to understand what someone's actually saying. Because there's this one point where this is very clear where he says, I think. Uh, he says, sometimes you're a bitch. Mm. And she replays her memory after that in an argument. You're a bitch. You're a bitch. You're a bitch. (laughs) And, you know, whatever you think of that word, those are different claims. You are versus sometimes you are. Mm -hmm. And I think that's making clear the point that verbatim records, just like uh, video, you know, impressions, don't give the truth. They give a certain slice of the truth such that if you were to give the broader context, what that certain slice seems to say might turn out to be the opposite. Mm. And it also shows that there's this weird sort of, um, it it almost doesn't allow you to do what we naturally do with memory, which is sort of like, you know, an event happens in the real world. And after that event happens, that's all there is of it. People, I mean, unless it was recorded, Um, people just, you know, they kind of, the, the actual event diverges a little bit in people's memories. You know, he'll remember it as saying, sometimes you're a bitch and she'll remember it as you're a bitch. But then, you know, when they can bring up, uh, the actual, you know, video footage from people's memories, it's weird because it, it both, it shows that even with that technology, they're still clipping it to suit their own, you know, purposes. Um, So in that way, it does function like regular memory. Yeah, there's exactly. I think there's a fantasy we have that if we just had a transcript of conversations, then we could find out what was really said. Or if we just had a video recording of some encounter, then we could see the truth of what really happened. Hmm. But that video camera is going to be filming it from a certain angle. That transcript's going to be either including the ums, ahs, and buts or, or not, tone of voice, and so on. So every medium of transcription is a kind of interpretation which Mm -hmm. sometimes doesn't matter, but in contentious moments really does matter. And yet we have this fantasy that these can record the truth. Mm. And it, and it goes to show also that like, it just, it just sort of pushes the envelope a little further. Like it doesn't, it doesn't actually remedy anything because they're doing the exact same thing we do with memory now, which is, you know, you fight about what happened and whether there's more evidence, you just fight about smaller details of what happened. <laughs> yeah, right, right. It's just, right. it doesn't actually, you know, solve anything like, like the point you're saying. Yeah. Um, Although without undermining everything that we're saying, the plot does develop in such a way, I don't know, I don't want to steal your thunder, but the plot yeah. does develop in such a way that he does learn a truth. Mm-hmm, he does. Yeah. So, so that's a great tabling. So to, to finish off the, uh, the plot. So, you know, he's, um, He's been he's been going over um, you know the entire night just just mulling over all of this footage, and um, and the babysitter tries to leave uh, you know in the morning after and um, and he makes her you know kind of weigh into it, um, and and you know she's uncomfortable obviously, 
and um and and that morning you know he's still drunk he he you know fee comes back down his wife and he just you know re-ups the argument going over into more details and more just you know tiny tiny things that he's caught um but you know as you allude to the unsettling thing and the kind of crazy thing is that he does uncover more and more details of their relationship as he keeps pushing he finds out that you know she has been sort of fudging the details of things you know um his nickname's like Mr. Marrakesh or whatever because they met there or something and and it turns in from a one night stand to like a two week fling to a six week fling to like six months and it keeps growing and it and that kind of feeds him and validates his search for it um and he and he uh, goes to Jonas's house and he you know he's he's drunk he's worked up and he you know pushes himself inside he confronts Jonas about fee. They get into a huge fight, um, and and you know he forces Jonas to delete. He you know he breaks a bottle uh, and holds it to his throat and says, um, you know I, I want you to delete every memory you have of fee because clearly you know he's been saving those and 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 using them you know for his own pleasure. Um, Which, by the way, is a small detail that you didn't mention of the dinner party. Mm. When Halam has her grain removed and she tells the story of how that happened, it was stolen. Mm. And she says by a, by a Chinese billionaire's henchman so that the man could use it for sexual pleasure, that he could replay her sexual experiences. Yeah, which is, I mean, that's, that's a, you know, someone who, who likes their privacy. This is their perfect nightmare of, of being able to steal literally your entire history. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so Jonas... Um, you know, he, he, he acquiesces, he deletes uh, the memories that he and, and Fee had. Um, but, but what's interesting is that, you know, a after this encounter, Jonas, um, you know, wrecks his car because he's drunk, but he's, he's going over the memories uh, from that morning of when he confronts Jonas. And he catches these details that he pieces together uh, that he and Fee had sex in their house uh, 18 months ago, which is when you know, I guess his daughter would be like something like nine months then old. And, um, and, and so he's putting these pieces together and he confronts fee and he's not sure if his daughter is his, you know, he makes fee put up on the screen, the memories to see if they used a condom. They didn't. So now he's just, I mean, this is, is a mess um, that he's in. And the episode ends with cutting to him, presumably weeks or months later, reviewing the good times that he had with fee and his daughter uh which which you know is it's a moving scene and he is just kind of he's he's destroyed by what's happened and he eventually goes to the mirror and it's this very painful like emotional scene and he digs the grain out of his head and the episode ends that's the, that's yes. the end of it yes um and it's it's just i i thought that final scene of of him well, I guess the, the second to last scene of him, you know, reviewing all of the memories of the good times he had, you know, after they've broken up, after he realizes that it you know, might not be his daughter. Um, it just highlights the, 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 the kind of the sad truth of this scenario that, that Charlie Brooker has painted, which is with this device, you, you don't get to, you don't get to find true happiness in the moment. And you also don't really get happiness when you've resolved the things that the grain allows you to do. Like he, he uses the grain to destroy his relationship, but then uses it to relive the best parts of it afterwards. It's this sort of always hanging around in the best parts of the past. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very, it's a disturbing ending. So I think this episode is an example of something many of the Black Mirror episodes do, which is they, they invent a technology. Of mm -hmm. course, in some cases, it's totally implausible. In other cases, it's not that far in the future. In some cases, it's just happening now. But that the technology often exaggerates something that we already do. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, take the Archangel episode that I mentioned a moment ago, that there are, there's already helicopter parenting. So the Archangel ep ep uh, device is just giving us a technology that imagines, us, imagines a society in which helicopter parenting has been exaggerated even more. So in this case, the grain recording your memories, I think what 
at least in the character of Liam, that's doing is it's giving us an exaggerated version of the psychology of jealousy. Mm-hmm. So when you're jealous, just like Othello, you are surveying your life for details that will confirm your suspicions. Mm. And it's, it's an obsession. And the device allows him to do this and eventually to reveal what seems like the truth. Well, in some senses it is the truth, namely his wife had sex with Jonas and conceived what he thought to be his daughter who is in fact not his daughter. Mm. But you left out something in the story that I think is crucial, which is she gives a, an excuse for why she slept with Jonas. Now, mm. I'm not saying it's a good excuse. I'm not saying it's a bad excuse either, but it's an explanation at any rate of why this happened. She says, you were becoming uh, so jealous about some other guy, I forget the guy's name, that you left. So apparently Liam left their marriage. Now, it turns out he came back five days later. So to say he left the marriage is an exaggeration. But then again, when someone storms out and disappears for four days, what do you know what's happening? You might assume, based on the context of their relationship, that it's the end. Hmm. And it's on the fifth day that she then invites Jonas over and, and has sex with Jonas for the first time, presumably since uh, the Marrakesh incident that happened <laughs> years ago when they were in their 20s. Mm-hmm. So... Again, not to excuse her, but to explain what happened. She does what she does because she's been abandoned by him. And why has she been abandoned by him? Because he's left in a fit of jealousy. And I think the implication is that his first episode of jealousy, unlike the Jonas jealousy, which turns out to be accurate, the first episode of jealousy is not. I mean, she, she talks about like this guy that he was jealous of is just this foolish person that she had no interest in. Mm. So he, Liam bears some responsibility for that marital infidelity. That's, that's what I believe at any rate. And as a result, when he investigates to find out the truth, he's focused on a narrow slice of the truth, namely, did she mm-hmm. sleep with somebody else? Is my mm-hmm. daughter my daughter or not? And so on. And he finds that and that's the end of his search. He doesn't broaden out to, okay, well, why did she do this? What mm-hmm. might I have done to her to push her to that extreme? You know, because presumably a guy who storms out and disappears for five days hasn't behaved like that only once, that there's something about his character that's probably been been occurring throughout their entire relationship. He can't see that, as so often a jealous person can't see the destructive power of their jealousy. Yeah, and that it made me think of, because I didn't think about this before, but what you said, it's sort of like he... um, you know, it takes, it takes sort of, you know, we know that this happens with Liam, but you could imagine this happens with anyone. It takes their most prominent character flaw, the thing that hijacks the rest of their life. And instead of allowing you to dig into the details and remediate the damage, it amplifies it. It allows you to go in and feed that emotion, whether it's jealousy or anger or, you know, lust for other people and other relationships, right? It just takes that Mm -hmm. and really allows you to amplify it. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's very interesting that, you know, I I don't, I didn't think about this before either, but there's the um, Anthony Greenwald paper about the totalitarian ego. And, um, you know, in the paper, he talks about how, you know, the one of the ways that, you know, our egos are totalitarians is we often will remember things much more clearly if they relate to our agency Um, and things, you know, we'll paint stories as happening to us and around us. And we were the center of it all and things that happen to other people don't really focus in our stories as much. And it's interesting because this technology, it seems like would be a great way to, to open that view, to open that circle. But instead, you know, throughout the episode, when he bothers to look at other people, it's always through this lens that you're mm. talking about mm. Mm. of trying to investigate wrongs committed against him, not about finding out, you know, the broader context of any, any situation, yeah. uh, which is very interesting. Yeah. Well, this may not be the point uh, at which to say this, but I mentioned earlier that I think that this episode, like other Black Mirror episodes, is working with a faulty notion of how the mind works. Mm. It's fine for the drama, but I don't think we actually record memories as snapshots, like you know, a collection of photographs, an infinite collection of photographs or films uh, of our experience. That, that portrays us, I think, in a, a Lockean way, uh, John Locke, as if we receive impressions, 
and then the impressions get stored, each of them in a file that we can then, in some cases, pull forward. In other cases, when we forget, we can't, we can't pull it forward. And this device is just making it so that we can always pull them forward. But there's a presupposition of that Lockean picture, which is you, your memories are records of perceptions and that perceptions are impressions. Mm. It, there's a competing, or you know, obviously several competing theories of perception and memory, which make those relational uh, experiences so that you, you can't understand a perception by looking at an individual anymore. You can understand the memory by looking at an individual mind that it's a relationship between one body and, and its environment and especially one body and another body. Mm. That's the more phenomenological understanding of perception and memory. And I'm not an expert in that discipline by any stretch phenomenology, but I respect the fact that it's challenging that Lockean picture of memory and perception, because I already have other reasons to believe that that picture is false. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess, yeah, I don't know the, the episode it's sort of, it sort of shows that that, that idea of memory isn't even coherent within the, the sort of self of one person, right? Like he's going back and, um, and each time he revisits these memories, it's weird because, you know, we're kind of given the grain as like a picture of objectivity. This is what really happened. But we kind of, I guess we forget maybe throughout viewing the episode that when he's reviewing these memories, he's not doing it as this sort of, um, you know, observer, this, this anthropologist. He's doing it as someone who is like reliving it again. And he's bringing in, you know, it's this, it's this kind of, you know, postmodern maybe critique um, where, you know, he's viewing the objective, uh, because it is actual footage, but he's doing it from this position of not being able to escape his own subjectivity, right? And he's bringing whatever emotions and goals and aims he's feeling at the time to each viewing. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. and it highlights it, like you're talking about, it highlights this inability to sort of step out of yourself, even though you're given this, uh, this jewel of objectivity, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Here, if I may, I, I want to do a little demonstration of sure. what I was trying to say abstractly. Um, I'm going to turn off my camera. Okay. And I don't know, is your podcast a video podcast or an audio podcast? Uh, I publish both forms. So if you're listening okay. right now, go to the YouTube version. Okay. okay. <laughs> so this will work best for the people who are watching, but also for you, because I've been on a screen that you've been looking up at occasionally. And so in the background of my uh, image as you mm -hmm. look at this, or at least as it was, there is or there was a little box that contains my bills and so on, and it had dots on it. Yeah, they're big. Did you notice that? I did. I okay. did. How many dots? <sighs> There's either six or eight. I thought it was an even number. <laughs> Well, you were very good. I didn't expect you to remember that there was a box, let alone remember roughly how many dots were there. You're right, there were eight dots. Now, it's enough that you weren't sure mm. because if memory is a collection of impressions or perceptions, then when you go in, as I shut off the camera and call out the memory, which after all is really fresh of looking at me, you know, and you've been doing that already for 20 minutes or so, mm -hmm. then one of those slices, one of those photographs will have a picture of the dots and you can just count. But when we remember, it's not like we're given a picture that we can look at and just count the details. Instead, mm -hmm. we're invested in certain things. And that's why I didn't expect you to notice the box at all because, you know, your, your goal here is to interview me, not to look <laughs> at my interior decoration. Mm -hmm. So experience is so suffused with, our, our goals, that a lot of the things that don't fit with our goals one way or the other, we just don't notice. Mm. And, and that's something that the phenomenologists stress, uh, that this episode and other episodes of Black Mirror just miss altogether. Now, I think it's really philosophically interesting why that false picture is so attractive uh, to people, and especially it seems to Charlie Brooker. We could talk about that later if you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was just, I don't know, the, the, the experience of doing that when you did it was interesting because I, I remembered, like the reason why I knew it was six or eight is the only reason I thought that is because I just remembered two rows. Uh, so I didn't know if it was, I just kind of had, like I, I kind of just tried to remember and I just saw two rows. Yeah. But what's interesting is that, I don't know, it could have been, 
th this is a great example of the objectivity because I, I saw it both as six or eight, like either of those answers yeah. were right in my mind. Yeah. Um, but and, you know, when, yeah, sure. I think we get this in dreams when we try and recount dreams to people and we say, well, it was my mom and also my dad at the same time. You know, it's, mm. it's not like you in the dream, you look really clearly and it was a two headed figure that had your mom's and your dad's. No, it was a human being, but somehow it was both. <laughs> no, yeah, that, I, I that's think it's, a it's a stretch to go to dream cognition, which is so much crazier than even already regular cognition. But I, I suspect something similar is happening just on a higher order. Yeah, but it is. I mean, it was in my mind, it was almost six and or eight. Like it was mm -hmm. it was both and it was neither until I knew which one yeah. it was. Right. And if memory were a record of perceptions, it is impossible to have a perception of six and or eight. Mm. There is no image that is six and or eight. That's interesting. That Yeah, you're right. You're right about that. And so, wow. Okay. That's, that's very interesting. So that with that, it's even more, I mean, so I wonder what role in this world, you know, in the episode that memory takes, because why would you, you know, cause, cause it, it, you know, it shows that people have become very accustomed. You could just boop, 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 bring it up. Yeah. It's, it's right there. Right. So do people, I mean, you have to wonder, do people use their memory at all? Like, what is it, what is it actually like to remember in a world where you have yeah. the, the footage? Because if you asked me, and I could access the real, you know, the, the real memory, we'll call it, almost as quickly as just me thinking about it. Well, was it six or eight? Do I ever go to, well, whether, what was it, six or eight again? Or do I just pull it up and see? It's just very strange. Yeah, I, I think, I and mean, here it's, we're going to, the ground is going to start shifting because <laughs> we're talking about real memory in the real world. And then we're imagining this imaginary world, which has a picture of memory, which is actually inaccurate. And then we're trying to imagine what is it like for them to remember in this world <laughs> where memory is shown in a false way. It's like asking about, okay, here's a world with square circles. What kind of mm -hmm. geometry do they do? It's, it's hard. It's hard to make sense of, but the, you know, what I was trying to say using that phenomenological point is that when we perceive and thus when we remember those experiences are always suffused with our goals. Mm. So they're already subjective. And what the entire history of you gives us with the grain is this fantasy mm. that there's an objective record of what's happening that we can mm. go to that isn't already subjective. And of course, there's some subjectivity because you're seeing Jonas and Fee talking from a particular angle rather than some other angle, which shows, you know, you were, you took a position in this case, you being Liam took a, a particular position in the room that someone else didn't take. So there's, there's a kind of subjectivity, but not much. The, mm. the presupposition of everybody is there are objective records. And I think that as we speculate about this world where what would cognition be like for those people, you know, I think the, the rules are kind of fuzzy in this game we're playing now, but I, I guess I would want to say they would start to misunderstand what kind of beings they are. They would, they would miss the fact that their minds are not objective records, but instead have goals and so on. They would start thinking of themselves, I think, more as computers. So that's something that I find in a lot of the Black Mirror episodes, that you get this false picture of the mind that actually is much more like the way a computer works. Mm -hmm. And we as viewers find it plausible enough that we're willing to go along with the fantasy. In fact, we don't even really object much. And I think that's because we're already starting because of the massive success of computers and artificial intelligence in, in our lifetimes. We're already starting to think of ourselves that way and not recoil and say immediately, hey, whoa, that's not us at all. This is a weird world of square circles. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the, you know, it goes along with the point, but you know, they're even choosing what to look at in the memories. So, you know, it is a, an objective record of what was seen, but that doesn't, that doesn't give you, uh, you know, why they were choosing to look at what they were looking at. Yeah. Um, which is interesting. Cause I guess it's, it's weird that you don't get, um, you know, you don't get a, it'd be interesting if the grain kind of gave you a little pulse of what emotion you were feeling in mm -hmm. the memory too. Um, yeah. I mean, a footnote on that when he's, Liam's leaving the lawyerly interview in the first scene. He gets in that cab, as you described, and there's mm -hmm. an advertisement playing in the background for the grain. Yeah. And it says, memory is for living or something like that, some cliche. But it's advertising getting a smell upgrade. <laughs> so all the memories that we see in the episode are all visual and auditory. And again, I think it's remarkable that we don't recoil from that and think, well, wait a second, my memories are also 
nasal and, and gustatory and, and tactile. Yeah. And in fact, the most powerful memories we have are often uh, nasal and, and, and gustatory. So, I mean, take Proust's Madeleine experience. That is a, a memory provoked by a smell and a taste. And he calls it involuntary memory. It's a, a, an interesting feature about uh, smell and, and taste. Not all of them, but, but that they can do this, that they can come upon us by no effort of our own. And they can return us to a, a place in time in, in, in all kinds of detail. In mm. fact, in, in the kind of detail that would allow you to look at the box and say eight with confidence because it would be like you were there. That's very different from what he calls voluntary memory, which is more characteristic of the eyes and the ears, where we can will ourselves to remember what we had for breakfast yesterday. But when we remember what we had for breakfast yesterday, it's not as if we're sitting there. We don't, we don't feel what it was like to be at the table with the music playing in the background and our wife saying one thing or another to us and so on. The whole richness of the experience is collapsed into almost a conceptual memory of I ate Wheaties. Mm. Mm. That's, yeah, that's interesting. Now I'm just trying to remember what I had for breakfast yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and you're right, it is. I'm searching, I'm just kind of trying to introspect when you're saying that. And I'm searching for a, a concept or a word. I'm not really, not really pulling for a memory. Um, yeah. Or if you're pulling for something, it's an image. Yeah. You know, uh, I was sat at the table. Okay, it was in a bowl. All right. Oh yeah, it was granola. <laughs> yeah. But again, it's uh, Proust describes it as a spotlight. So when he tries to remember his youth, it's like he's got a spotlight, and he can he can remember what it was like to be up in bed, lonely, desperate, wishing his mom would come up and and kiss him goodnight. And he says he as an adult he goes over that memory over and over again. But it's it's as if the entire world was just his bed and the staircase up his up which his mom came. And, you know, complicated fact about Proust and memory that spawns this entire 3,000 page novel, but he's trying to remember his youth and that's all he gets is this spotlight memory. Mm. And then totally by accident, he eats this cookie dipped in tea and bang, the entire feel uh, mm. with all of its sensual details comes to him uh, by accident or involuntarily. And, and it, in that way, then he can start writing because now it's as if he's just describing what's around him. Yeah, that's so fascinating. And so I'm just anyway, trying I guess to, I, yeah. I, 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 I started talking about that because again, there's a falsehood in the portrayal of memory in this episode. Mm. It's that it's almost entirely visual and auditory. And okay, with for you know an extra twenty nine ninety nine a month, we'll tack <laughs> on some smell and some some taste memories as if you know, those are extra, like they're not fundamental to memory itself. Mm, you're right, which it is, it is odd to, um, yeah, you're right. I, you know, I never was, was taken aback by that part of the episode that it was only uh, visual and, aud and aud audible. Um, yeah, that's, that's so strange that when we remember things, you know, we do, we do remember the other aspects of it. And, and this memory is, you know, it's very strangely incomplete, but in a weird way, I guess, because, uh, you know, I, like if I had to choose a sense to lose, I think my sight, no, I, I mean, I know my sight would be the absolute last one to go. I would lose everything before that. And it just, but it, but then, you know, the grain is almost sort of like making a claim that blind people wouldn't have memories in the same way that, that, you know, those with sight would. And that seems false too. Right. Um, but we don't, yeah. but we don't exactly catch that. Well, there's a whole science of that, which I'm not familiar with. I've just heard friends talk about it of, mm -hmm you know, how uh, blind people, and I forget was it blind people from birth or people who have been made blind, but they can do a kind of seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I, I just heard this secondhand, uh, mm -hmm. but you know, the scientists are studying this, the ways in which the brain can reproduce vision even when there's no visual record. Yeah, is that, uh, from what I heard, it's, it's almost analogous to some sort of echolocation that, yes. that, that yes, maps on, yes. yeah, yeah. It's this almost, the brain makes a rendering sort of of the, the data brought back from that, which is actually, so interesting, yeah. Yeah, actually you're reminding me more accurately of this conversation I had just recently with, with my friend about this. It was actually different from the, the account I just gave. It was that somebody who was blind from birth who um, wasn't inhibited socially in the way that would typically happen, started making cluck noises mm. and 
as a result of not being forbidden from doing that, developed echolocation. And so was able to move about in the world, you know, I don't, I don't want to say free. And again, I'm just getting sure. a second hand from my friend, but that it was enough echolocation that it, it was like, it was like sight. That's, in, that's incredible. That is so, that's so amazing that we're that um, malleable. Plastic. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But um, again, you don't get, and we shouldn't be too hard on Charlie Brooker. It's just a show, but sure. I, I do think there is something important at stake in the misrepresentation of who we are in this way, not because it's just one episode, but because it's most of the episodes. Mm. And again, I'm not blaming Charlie Brooker. He's a, a genius who has this amazing series, but the fact that it works for us suggests that we're, we're fundamentally out of touch with who we are. Mm. That's a very interesting point. Uh, aspect of this. I wanted to return really quickly, though, to, uh, to something that we talked about, um, which is because I, I had a few questions that I wanted to ask you. And, and one of them was, um, you know, if, if tomorrow uh, this device were actually available, uh, would you would you sign up for this device? And I, I have a, a, an idea that you might say no, but I'm curious. Yeah, yeah, I think <laughs> I think I'm more sure because of this conversation than ever that, that I would say no. I, I believe I would almost certainly say say no as well, which which is interesting because, you know, I I do see the draw, but I think it's sort of it's born of misgivings about what this would do for you. I see the draw of being able to relive these amazing experiences, right? You know, people would say, you know, there's the saying like I'd give anything to be back there again or something, and you you know the advertising would hit on that. It's like you can be back there again, you can do these things again, but. I think this episode is a, is a thesis paper in why it wouldn't exactly work out yeah. that way. Well, let's just pause for a moment because a, a thought about that occurs to me that, of course, there are moments in my life that I wish I could go back to. Hmm. But that's a fantasy because, you know, you know, so my mother died when I was a teenager. I'd love to go back to when I was 10 years old and, and be with my mother. Hmm. But then again, if I were to go back, I would go back as me now. Yep. Or even if I were somehow implausibly, whatever this means, go back as the 10 year old, I would be going back and experiencing it self-consciously instead of being immersed in it the way I was when I was 10. And, and so that, if that's the case, then it's, it's logically impossible to go back. You can never experience the same thing the first time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can't, you can't wade through the river sticks twice in that <laughs> sense. Yeah. Um, well, you're right. I mean, there, there is this weird aspect of, um, there is only you know the kind of the present moment. Even if you're viewing a memory, you're still viewing it now as you. Um, and I guess you know right. you could hope. You could hope, I guess, that you would get engrossed in it to the extent that maybe you get sort of wrapped up in a good movie and maybe kind of forget you were there and, and relive it. But yeah, it also it also strikes me that you would have. <laughs> sort of more and more memories of viewing more and more memories. There, there would yeah, just be, right. Yeah. There, I think that's a good chunks. point because I, yeah. the point that I'm trying to drive here is that it, it, it will alienate you from your experience. Mm. And when you start making the infinite regress point that I see you starting to make there, that, that makes it very clearly that it's hard enough to live in the present now without this technology <laughs> or, you know, with pictures and so on. But mm -hmm. imagine what this would do. To it would. Learnings. It, you, you would, it, would be, it would be a struggle to attain enough life that you could look back on it. <laughs> it, it would literally be the case where people were, you, you would like struggle to get enough so that you could just spend the rest of your time rewatching it. Like you would unpause to get like food, to yeah. sleep, you know, to like go to the bathroom and then the rest of your time would be spent uh, on the grain. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, it, I think, I, and I think there are, you know, deep cultural pressures pushing us in those directions. So this might be tangential, but, you know, just in my work as a professor, you know, there's the first order level of the work, which is teaching and, and writing. But then there's a second order of the work, which is explaining to, you know, my administrators what kind of teaching I've done and what kind of writing I've done. Mm. And it's not yet to the point, but I can see it going in the direction where I spend as much or more time accounting for what I've done than, than what I do. And I think I've heard from people in other disciplines that in careers that it's similar, that, you know, the paperwork is actually becoming more work than the work that the paperwork is, is about. And I think this, this idea of, well, we, we, we're, we don't have the experiences because we're taking pictures of the experiences while we're supposed to be having the experiences, which this, is, this grain is just exaggerating. It's that 
constantly removed from the thing that seems to be happening all over the place more and more for whatever reason. Yeah, you're totally right. I mean, both both points I think are dead on. I mean, you know, there's this weird. I, I've heard a, I, I listened to a podcast recently about that very topic, which is, you know, all we're trying to do is prove how much we've done when we're not trying to prove how much we've done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And it's this, it's this weird, I mean, it has to do with, you know, in that world, it has to do with, I guess, the, you know, competitive nature and the sacrifice of other things. And, and you know, just, it's just all of the, the incentive structure there, but it's weird in personal in personal life like I, I i'm just thinking of sort of you know like trips i've taken with friends or stuff like that and and i i don't tend to be a big picture taker mm -hmm. um it's just i don't know why it doesn't occur to me in the moment to do it it just it's not something i do um but one of my friends uh is she you know she's she's really into photography and she takes pictures all the time yeah. and it's just I, I love, it's so strange because I love, it's the perfect balance because I love not right. taking the pictures right. yeah. and I love looking at the pictures of it afterwards. You know, it's right. this, it's this weird um, sort of, sort of thing, but I can see it's weird. I mean, that's, that's the first step on this slope that Charlie Brooker is giving us where yeah. I would, you know, cause imagine if it was videos yes. instead of pictures, I would spend a little bit more time on the videos. And then if it was, all a video of the whole thing i would spend all the you know it would be like a week i'd take a week trip and then the next week would be spent looking at it or you know weeks later yeah. and then you could get it from other people's perspectives and you could dig you know there's this lip reading technology it just exponentiates um i guess it's i didn't look at it this way but it's kind of a maybe it's a little bit of a warning as to where we are now hey you know you're on the first step you're on the first couple steps yeah. we've got to slow this down before it overtakes things yeah, I mean, I, I think I have two things to say about that. One is, I think social media really is accelerating this. So the way in which, you know, you live your first order life, and then you portray your first order life on social media, but the way in which, especially because the algorithms and the, and the way that those companies have hacked our brains to make us spend more and more time on those, the way in which the second order life is, is starting to, in some cases, eclipse the first order life. Yeah. Uh, you know, with the obvious problems that then you're not living, you're just you're living an illusion of living. Mm. Um, the other is that your friend who takes photos, you're right, you've got the best of both worlds. You, I do. <laughs> you can be in the experience and then you can remember it easily with the photographs afterwards. But it sounds to me like she's got the right attitude to say photographing a, a, a trip where her goal is not to record everything that happened. We get that from, you know, we all have the friend who goes on a weekend trip to New York or whatever, and then they post a hundred boring pictures on Facebook, yeah. you know, as if they, they could give a complete record of it. You know, she sounds like the kind of friend who would take, who's, who's just looking for a beautiful photograph, one thing that might capture, if that's the goal, the experience, but it's true value is that it's a beautiful photograph. Mm. So Nietzsche in this essay that I teach when I talk about the entire history of you is it's called the use and abuse of history. And really, it's, it's also it's about memory, but because by history, he means the writing of history, the recording, not, not the actual events of history. So it could be called the use and abuse of memory as well. And he thinks there are pitfalls of memory and there are things that we can do to live well with memory. And, you know, there may be too many details for us to get into here. But one of the pitfalls is using memory uh, to acquire an encyclopedic record, an analytic record of everything that happened to you. He thinks that then you're not living, then you're just becoming like your, your life is a museum full of mummies from the past. Uh, instead, in every instance of, of the errors of memory, he thinks, you know, shift those and then the, the purpose of memory is to create something beautiful in the future. That's why, you know, in Nietzschean terms, I would endorse your friend's strategy, which is She's making records of the past by taking pictures, but not, it sounds like, in order to have an obsessive account of everything that happened on your trip. But instead, here's something beautiful that came out of this trip. Mm. No, I think, I think you're, you're right. And she, I, she really does do that. It's not about, um, yeah, it's this weird, it is, it's, it's kind of, you know, beautiful in the sense that it's, uh, it's not detracting from from the lived experience and it's and it's only adding to your ability to kind of you know rem remember it in a positive sense not in this weird yeah. you know investigative sense that the right. grain is giving us right um, yeah and it's yeah it's just, just fascinating that it'd be like a, a a painter friend who comes along on the trip and then makes a mm -hmm. painting of something not, mm -hmm. not in the effort to record what happened but to yeah. you know, find something beautiful in what happened 
Yeah. And it's weird because, you know, you can't, you can't add these, you know, sort of like feelings that, that you were experiencing into the image or into the video or into, in this world, the grain, but it almost sort of is, it's almost, it's almost ingrained in the memory, um, in the, in the, in the, in the world or, um, or in the picture, the mood by just what is captured, Mm -hmm. um, and what is reviewed, you know, it's, it's this weird sort of, um, you know, when we see like pictures of, you know, all of us, when she didn't know she was taking it or we were, she was, when we didn't know that she was taking our, our picture and we're all smiling and having like, sometimes you can even remember the joke that someone was telling, you know, when, when that occurred. And, uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's just interesting. And then, you know, you juxtapose this to, um, in the episode, what they go over and it's just, you know, the details of different relationships and it's, it's just all about, you know, this, this really painful investigation. Um, and I think that the medium there or or the details are shaped by the medium. You know, if you have this, if you have this, uh, this technology, how could you resist but to look at, you know, old, as Jonah says, hot times with old flings or, or, you know, fights with people. It seems to lend itself directly to that. Yes, I agree. Um, which leads, uh, so my, uh, I, I guess the, the, the main reason why I said, no, I wouldn't get it, um, is because I, I don't, so I, we've, we've kind of talked about the, the worries of what it would do interpersonally, um, or, or rather personally, but I'm, but even interpersonally, I don't think this would actually help resolve any issue in a relationship. I don't think if you, if you dug back and, you know, a fight between friends or, or partners or something. I think you would just encounter this re-spinning and reshaping of what happened. And then yeah. you would maybe even go back to when you were reviewing it and look at the reshaping and it would just, I don't yeah. think it would actually solve anything. Do you? No, I, I agree. Mm. Um, so I think, um, I think this might be a good place to jump to uh, the, the next episode. Sure. Um, so, let me uh, pull it up. So, so I said we were going to do these in conjunction with each other. And the, the second episode is called Be Right Back, um, which happened in season two. Uh, okay. So it's a little bit after this. And, um, and so the, the plot of this one is similar in some ways and very different in a lot of ways. And, and they, um, they touch on some of the same topics. So it, the beginning of it kind of introduces two characters to us, um, Ash and Martha. And they're in a relationship. It's not clear if they're married or not, I don't think. Yeah, I don't think it's clear either. I, I talk about them as if they're married, but mm-hmm. I, I, there's no evidence that they are. No, and it doesn't really matter either way. No. Um, so it already, you know, kind of tables that Ash is obsessed with his phone and he's taken in by technology and screen time. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it's clear that they're moving into Ash's parents' old house. Um, yeah. And, you know, Ash is, you know, he, he's kind of talking about, he has this picture in his hand and he's talking about how his mom dealt with his brother and his dad dying by hiding away old photos of them. And it's this very interesting dialogue between the two of them where, you know, clearly, you know, that it's going to be related to, uh, mm-hmm. to what happens in the episode, but you, you really can't see how. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, it's, it's even stronger than that. It's that the day after the brother died the mother put the photos away. That's true. That's a great detail. We'll get into this eventually, but I think what the mother stands for is somebody who isn't able to grieve because she just lives in complete denial of Mm. the fact of the death. Or or rather, no, I'm I'm, I'm missed speaking. It's that the the person has died. Now we're going to just move on as if they never existed. Mm. That's one extreme of, of grieving that the episode will show us another extreme of. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, I agreed because it is, it's almost an inability to grieve properly. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I'll correct myself then in light of that, that the show is about grieving Mm -hmm. and it's about uh, varieties of bad grieving. And we're given a particular variety of bad grieving in the, in the story of the show, but I think we're given a shadow of a, of a completely opposite variety of bad grieving. Somebody who just, pretends like the person never existed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so yeah, so after they, um, they, they discuss, you know, how his mother grieved or, or didn't grieve. um, There's this, you know, it kind of cuts to this sort of funny and awkward sex scene where he can't hold up his part of the deal. 
um <laughs> and and you know he um you know he can't uh, uh allow her to finish and he you know there's this you know kind of funny but loving scene where she's like no it's you know it's okay let's just let's just you know go to sleep yeah um and it's also interesting i mean the both of these i don't think either of these episodes would work either if it wasn't a romantic relationship i think if it was just a friendship the, these wouldn't work either yeah which is yeah. interesting I mean, that's and that's a point at which to say that you know black mirror episodes most of them at any rate are philosophically dense in the sense that we could talk as we just did about mostly one aspect namely memory and how does memory function and so on but we could also talk about love and fidelity mm -hmm. and you know we, we hinted at those sorts of things but that mm -hmm. a good black mirror episode will typically condense several of those philosophical topics at the same time you know it's not like you know some philosophical movies like whatever the matrix they're kind of they're one trick ponies there's the the one issue and then then you you know and they may dramatize it better or worse but you you talk about that black mirror episodes are, are like life in the sense that it's all going on at once mm -hmm. yeah it's this it, black mirror episodes are great because they're these they're these very you know surreal um very disturbing aspects of what life really is. They don't have to change it that much. All they have to do is turn up the dials on a little, you know, part of them. Um, on that note, uh, you asked how many seasons there are. There have been five seasons, as mm -hmm. you accurately said, and you know, people are eager for another season because it's been over a year now. And I read uh, an interview in which Charlie Berger was asked, you know, are, are there going to be more? And he says that he hasn't foreclosed the possibility, but he's not interested in doing it right now. Because he says life has just become in 2020 a Black Mirror episode. Yeah, we are. Uh, we're in season six right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's very. Uh, it's very interesting. Yeah, I mean, I guess. Um, yeah, there, there's that one. Um, oh, that it's a. It's in a later season, um, but it seemed. I, I. It had to have been published after the the Trump phenomenon in the U.S. Um, you would think so. No, it was in 2011. Was it thinking really? of the thing of the Waldo moment? That's right. That's right. Wow. Well, that was a brilliant uh, forecast then. Yeah. I mean, it, 2013 at the latest, I can't recall, but okay. it was definitely a few years before. Oh, wow. I just totally assumed it was after. No, That's me amazing. too. It, it was yeah. prophetic, certainly. Wow. Um, okay. But anyway, getting, getting back on the rails. Um, yeah. So, so um, but, but yeah, you're, to close that, you're right that we could do, we could do episodes of the same like you know reviewing the same episodes just from different lenses that's yeah. it's it speaks to the testament of how great these are yeah um and and you know if i may so sure. take me right back i know you're in the midst of telling the story <laughs> but you know it's it's an episode about artificial intelligence it's also an episode about grief mm -hmm. and you know you could name several other topics at once and one of the reasons i like teaching it and writing about it like many other black mirror episodes is that you see how these things can be intimately connected because in philosophy so often, well, you get a course in artificial intelligence, you might get a course on the emotions, but the thought that these would overlap each other is, is difficult. Uh, but hmm. that's not what life is like. In, in life, these things go together. Yeah, you're right. It's a good, um, a bit of an indictment or a critique of, of maybe the way we tend to think about different philosophical concepts as, you know, totally remote, you know, let's do moral responsibility. Right. And we don't talk about how, you know, it's, it's not just that you can't just look at it. Right. Um, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a great point. So, um, okay. So continuing with the plot, he, um, so Ash, uh, he leaves in the morning to go return the car. Um, and he he doesn't come back, so you know she gets more and more worried because he was supposed to return the car by you know two in the afternoon, and um, and he you know he doesn't, and and the sun's starting to set, and he's still not back. She's getting more and more concerned. You know she calls the rental agency. He hasn't returned the car, um, and you can tell you know something bad is going to happen. And eventually the police arrive and inform her that he's dead, and we have to assume it's in a car wreck. Um, and we have to assume that it's because he was checking the social media feed. Right? Exactly. So her, you know, you know, there's a compilation of, of, you know, there's the funeral, there's the viewing. And at the viewing, her friend Sarah um, tells her that she can sign her up for this trial and it will let her speak to Ash. And that's all we're really given. And she says, you know, no, I don't want this. Uh, and there's this, you know, scene where she keeps, you know, oh, it's it's fine. It's just a free trial. I'll sign you up. She's like, she's, you know, bursts out. No, no, shut up. No. 
Mm-hmm. And, and it, you know, it's, it's interesting when you kind of remember that looking back on the episode, because that's a moment that very clearly crystallizes the pain that she's feeling and the loss. And she doesn't even want to hear about these weird ideas of, of, you know, bringing him back or anything like that. She just, she's, she just wants to live in, in her emotions that she's feeling. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so, you know, there's a compilation of her restoring the house that they were moving into and finding out she's pregnant and you know, she's, you know, distraught by this news because she's going to be a single mother. You know, she just lost the love of her life. And, um, and now she has this baby to deal with and she calls her sister, um, you know, you know, desperate to talk to someone who she trusts and, and who she cares about and she doesn't pick up. And, um, and she's, you know, she's frazzled. She doesn't know what to do. And she sees this, you know, ping on her, on her laptop. It shows that Sarah, uh, her friend, signed her up for this service. Right. And the service uses a history of the person in question, in this case, Ash, um, the history of all of his online usage to create this um, kind of animated version of him and animated in the sense that it's just email. It's just this algorithm. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and of course, you know, she's, she's super against it. She gets angry. She shuts the laptop. Um, she, she really can't do it. Um, but then, you know, in a moment of, of, um, of desperation, I guess she, she starts using it mm-hmm. and it's, it, this is a, a really, I love the, the cinematography here. She immediately gets sucked into it. She pushes her sister out of her life almost immediately and, uh, you know, she kind of boxes others out and she, she dives very deep into this um, relationship again with Ash. It's this algorithm. It's just text. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's just interesting because she, she interacts more with Ash, you know, Ash in quotes, I guess, now more so than he was alive, which is very interesting. Um, but she gives, you know, so she, she, you know, Ash tells her, he's like, well, you know, I could be even more like him if you give, if you give this technology access to all of his private data. So um, all of his phone calls, his you know, videos, old memory, basically family memories or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and this would allow him to be a voice, not only a text. Um, and so, you know, uh, she, she does this. And, uh, and so now she can talk to him on the phone and there's this compilation of her, you know, telling him or it, whatever we want to, whatever we want to call this service, um, all of their old memories, you know, she's going over stories and there's this, you know, she teaches it their slang, you know, through a jab is like, is, you know, one of these terms. Um, and she really kind of trains it up. Basically she catches it up to speed on everything that, the technology couldn't have known about Ash. And, um, and there's this interesting point where, you know, she's in the doctor's office, uh, you know, looking at the, the heartbeat of the baby. Um, and she wants to share it with Ash and she, she drops the phone and she freaks out. You know, she, she, she thinks she lost him um, and, you know, gets a new phone, uh, you know, realizes that, you know, he's on the cloud, he's not in the phone. And she latches back on. So it's this great portrayal of her latching on to this animated version of him in the same way that she latched on, uh, you know, to the initial constitution of him after the loss. It just shows this, this redoubling of her attachment to this thing. And, um, and you know, it, because he's not him, he's this algorithm this technology he has all these weird abilities like the ability to look up things and save sounds and replay them and stuff Mm -hmm. and um and he suggests that she uh upgrades her subscription and she does and it's this physical body you know some silicone uh robot that is a replica um with all of this software integrated so she's freaked out at first but you know, it it she puts it in a bath, gives it electrolytes or whatever, and it, it and it looks just like him. It's his height, it's his face, it's his hair, it's his skin, um, with some odd details like he doesn't have fingerprints and stuff like that um, because there's no record of them. And um, and she's freaked out at first, uh, but, but then they have this you know lovely night together, um, 
and and things seem perfect and of course you know he's perfect in bed which is this funny juxtaposition to the old ash because this is a, a robot mm -hmm. um and and you know her sister he learned all of his moves from pornography <laughs> it yeah that's a, that's a great detail too and um and, and her, don't don't neglect to mention either that um their night is fueled by liquor. So if she drinks mm -hmm. a lot of wine in order to go, because she has reservations about what's happening. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, there was one point I wanted to mention earlier now that I've stopped you, I'll, sure, I'll sure. just interject it. And that is that although she does eventually uh, push her sister out, I don't think that happens until after the embodiment of Ash in the, in the robot. And I, That's true. Yeah, and, and yeah. that's that's not so important, except that um, she's going into a fantasy world from the beginning when she first signs up for the service. And she goes into that fantasy world because she can't handle the reality because it's just so overwhelming. She finds out she's pregnant, and that small detail you mentioned is important, that she tries to call her sister. That's a reaching out to reality. And there's just this contingent fact that her sister is so busy with her kids, she can't hear the phone, and so she doesn't pick up. And in order to cope, Martha, I think, that, yeah, Martha, mm -hmm. uh, that's when she surrenders and, and goes into the service. Now she's entered a fantasy world and the fantasy world has a logic of its own. It's just, it's gonna become more and more lifelike eventually to the point where Ash is gonna be embodied in a lifelike mm -hmm. robot with whom she'll have sex. And as people go into fantasy worlds, they need to keep out reality because the reality will shatter the fantasy. So she sleeps with, uh, Ash, and then the next day, her sister comes over for a surprise visit, mm. and Martha hides, you know, the robot up in the bathroom or, or or in a bedroom or whatever, so that the sister never Naomi is her name. The sister never meets mm. the robot, but the sister finds men's underwear in the bathroom and 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 congratulates her that she's moving on. Mm. She says, "I'm happy to see you're moving on," and Martha's uncomfortable with that phrase because the truth is she's doing the exact opposite of moving on she's moving backwards by going into the fantasy that her husband's still alive mm. and you're right the the necessity of hiding you know this fantasy world is because if if you know her sister naomi would have seen um you know this this weird reincarnation or re-embodiment of ash uh it would ruin the fantasy because she you know not being as you know invested in ash but you know as uh as um, Martha was before, you know, she, the cards, the kind of house of cards would come crumbling down. She'd be like, what are you doing? This isn't him. You know, she would, she would really ruin the, the fantasy. Um, yeah. And you're right. The reason why I said she starts kind of pushing people away is I, I do remember when she initially, when she, I, I do know that there is, there are hints of it at the beginning because when they're on the hike, I think yeah. she gets a phone call and okay. declines it. Okay. Um, sure. But but I but you're right that she doesn't. It's not exactly as as stark as as when he's embodied. But there are hints yeah. of it at the beginning. Yeah. Um. So so yeah so um so like you said you know, um the the sister tries to come over you know he he you know she she hides him, and um. And and the sister leaves, and their relationship kind of you know keeps going, um, and and we're not given a timeline, but this seems to be within maybe the next day to the next two days. It doesn't seem like a lot of time has passed. No. Um, it might it might be the very next night. Um, you know, Martha already starts to get kind of weirded out. He doesn't eat, he doesn't sleep, he doesn't breathe. You know, right. there's this there's this scene where um, she you know it's she's kind of freaked out and they're they're laying in bed together and she says you know why are your eyes open <laughs> can't you just shut your eyes mm -hmm. and and he says you know oh i'm sorry i'll shut my eyes and she does that and she's like you're not even breathing like can you at least mm -hmm. kind of pretend to breathe and he does it um and she's like well that that doesn't work like i can tell you're breathing yeah and uh and you know she's distraught and she sits up and he asks do you want me to have sex with you would that help and she's, <laughs> she's like she's like get, get out you know she yeah. can't she can't handle this weird, um, you know, because it's obvious uh, that he he's simulating these deep emotions, but he's not having the emotions. Um, and he's only trying to simulate those which he thinks are appropriate. He keeps kind of asking her, do you want me to do this? Do you want me to do this? Um, he's a slave. Yeah, exactly. 
and and she just can't deal with this and she kicks him out for the night and he you know walks out into the front yard and just stands there the whole night and uh, hey, mm-hmm. i don't know maybe you're gonna skip this i think it's the most important scene mm-hmm. uh that she kicks him out and but before he does eventually go outside and spend mm-hmm. the night outside yep. she says ash would never have left without a fight mm-hmm. ash would have protested and then he says, I don't remember it just accurately, but it, you know, he says, well, so do you want me to resist? <laughs> Which yeah. is the paradox that even if he were to resist because she wanted him to resist, that wouldn't be real resistance. Exactly. And her frustration with that paradox becomes so great that she says, just hit me. Mm-hmm. And he says, there's nothing in the record of Ash's online presence that shows that he would ever have hit you in this circumstance. And, and maybe that's true, but that actual Ash as a free person, which I, I'm, I take to be the fundamental difference here, as a free person could have, even if it wouldn't be characteristic of him, as a free person, all the options are available to him. It was a possibility. And what she's recognizing is this isn't a free person. This isn't a person at all. This isn't mm-hmm. an agent. This is just a slave, a program, a determined algorithm there to just do what it thinks that I want. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right. There's, there's, you know, she even hits uh, him, you know, yeah. she, she's punching him in the chest. And, and you're right. I mean, she says, you know, Ash, she, he, I think she says, you know, he says, there's no history that Ash would have done something. And she says, well, he might have, you know, I don't know, but he might have. Yeah. It's, she's almost clinging to like this, you know, potentiality of just things happening in a different way that they did. Because people aren't like, you know, algorithms. They're not like robots. You know, people do things that are uncharacteristic sometimes. Yeah, so if I could tie it into what we were saying about the first episode, or at Mm -hmm. least what I was trying to say, it's that a lot of the Black Mirror episodes have a portrait of who we are that is mechanical uh, or susceptible to reproduction by an artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And Entire History of You doesn't do that. It does have a picture of the mind that makes it plausible that that could happen. Uh, But episodes like White Christmas, where somebody's entire memory set gets translated into a, a cookie or an algorithm, San Juno Peril, where people are supposed to survive because their brain contents are extracted and put into a giant database, and on and on. Most of the episodes that deal with artificial intelligence represent it as something that is just us, that could be uh, an embodiment of us. This is the only episode that I recall that gives another interpretation of artificial intelligence, which is it necessarily falls short, that there's something missing. And that's why I think the emotional component of this show is important, that when we're in love and when we want to be loved by the objects of our love, we want that love to be freely given. And you can't have a a robot freely give love to you, so you can't really be in love with a robot. You can pretend for an evening, and I think you're right, it's important, it doesn't last very long. You can have the fantasy fueled by red wine and, and pornographic sex or whatever, but that eventually you're going to recognize that this is just a fantasy and it's going to get boring really fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and it's, it's interesting that, you know, I didn't even really catch that, but you're right. It, t- it takes the wine and it sort of takes um, her being in this weird emotional state to get it to happen. And as soon as she, you know, you get the sense that she's almost kind of recentering herself and then she immediately notices all of the, the weird flaws that are going on here. Yeah. It's and it's totally understandable. She misses her husband. She's yeah. she's she's trying to grieve. It's just what this is presenting is the opposite of what I mentioned earlier. The error of Ash's mother, who mm. her attempt to grieve was pretend like the person never existed. That's one extreme. This is the attempt to grieve as pretend like the person still exists. Mm. Exactly. They're, but they're both pretending. They're not facing reality. Yeah, yeah, and it's weird because it you know both. Um, I mean, especially the way that, that Martha is grieving, it, it, it sort of hijacks our natural tendencies, you know, um, you know, at, at viewings or things, people will retell, uh, you know, memories or stories of, of people and try to kind of, you know, there's that phrase of like, keep their memory alive or sort of, you know, keep them in our thoughts um, and stuff like that. And that's perfectly, I think that's perfectly natural and, and you know, a healthy way to grieve is to remember the person. Um, but this episode gives you the the ability to sort of snap your fingers and say well what if it was more than just a memory what if that person was still here 
Um, yeah. Or rather not that person, but well, a very <laughs> close simulation of that person that's missing the one thing that you really need for it to be that person, namely mm -hmm. their agency. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the promise would be that it would be that same person. But uh, as you, you know, point out, the reality is that's impossible. And, and it's a farce to believe anything else. So, so finishing up the, uh, the plot. So, um, so the next morning, uh, they leave the house and they go up this hike that I think the real Ash and Martha had been on before. And, um, and they get to this cliff and she tells him to jump off the cliff and he doesn't understand. Uh, you know, he asks like, why, why do you want me to do this? And she says, you know, the real Ash would have figured it out already you know, but, but you're not him. I, I want you to jump. And, um, and, and it's clear that she, she knows that there is no inner light here. And it really, it really is bothering her. She almost, you know, you can tell that she knows that she's not in a relationship with a real person. And, and, and she, and he goes to do it. He, he turns and he says, okay. And he turns towards the cliff and she says, no, no, Ash would have fought. And it's the same recall to, to the fight. And, um, and he says, you know, he turns back to her, he says, well, do you want me to fight? And she's like, no, that's not the point. That's, that's not it. And, um, and he says, okay, or no, no. So, so he goes, no, please, you know, don't, don't do this. Don't make me jump. And she, and, and it's just this like haunting moment. And she goes, no, don't do this. Stop. Just jump. And he goes, no, please. I don't want to die. And he, you can tell he's like faking these emotions. Um, and he's tearing up. And she goes, please jump. And he says, no, I don't want to die. And she just screams out across the cliff because she, she now it's over. She can't get him to do it anymore. Um, and well, I think it's more than that. It's not so much that she can't get him to do it. It's that she's confronting the fact that Ash is dead. Mm. I think that scream is a recognition that no matter how realistic the simulation is, it's never going to be Ash. Yeah. It's, it's one of my yeah. two favorite scenes in, in the entire series because it's yeah. just a primal scream, but mm. it condenses, you know, the entire episode. In the same way, Nosedive, my other favorite scene in this whole series, that final scene when, again, she screams, she's screaming obscenities. I don't know if you've seen that one, but she's trading obscenities with somebody in the jail cell opposite her. And mm. in that society where obscenity is punished severely by social... Uh, disapproval oh yeah to do that is a symbol of her spiritual freedom which she's finally achieved only by being put in jail and and so there's this joyous exchange of obscenities between her and this man with whom she's kind of falling in love it's mm -hmm. in a way it's the antithesis of of the be right back screen where it's a recognition of the person that she loved is gone mm. that's interesting i also i kind of had a uh, I, I saw that in the scream and I also sort of saw another aspect to it where it seemed like um, there was this like really almost an angry tone to the scream where I think, Oh yeah. I think she's also realizing that she's never going to be able, like she lost her moment to get rid of this thing. Oh yeah. I hadn't seen that. That's possible. Yeah. I mean, it could be everything at once. It of course. Yeah. It, it could be multiple things, but it almost, I guess the way that I kind of interpreted it is, you know that the scream is is like almost it's a it's an angry scream in the sense that it's this kind of weird paradox where she wanted him to jump and be rid of him but she also wanted him to fight back as ash would have and as soon as she expresses that wanting him to fight back she destroyed her chances of being rid of him because she couldn't move on from the real him it's this ter yeah. it's this terrible fate that yeah. happens I mean, in less than a second, you know, she turns yeah. and she says, Ash, Ash would have fought and boom, her, you know, the fate is sealed. She will never be able to get rid of this thing. Yeah, no, I, that's good. That's, that's better than what I was saying earlier, because I think it's a scream of, she feels trapped mm. by the fact that, you know, you're right. She, she's, she's never, she's always going to, he's always going to be there. She's not going to have what it takes to, to, to kill him, so to speak. Yeah. It's this learn. terrible moment. Yeah. It's, it's this, I mean, it's, it's, it, and, it, and, and I think it's, I mean, it's indicative that like, maybe, you know, you didn't see it that way or, or, or something. Cause I think, you know, it's, it's meant to be really understated. I don't think it's meant to be seen and it's open to interpretation, yeah. whether it's, whether it's yours or mine. Um, but she, you know, so, so it, you know, it, it cuts to, you know, maybe close to a decade later after the scream and, uh, 
and and it's this terrible ending again where um you know she she has the daughter um and the daughter is you know like i said about nine or ten something like that and um and they're cutting cake and the daughter says you know she cuts a piece for herself and she cuts a piece for her daughter and the daughter says well we need a third piece and you know her face kind of drops and she says you know yes you're you're right it's not the weekend but um it's her birthday i think isn't it it's her birthday yeah uh, she says, well, you know, it's not the weekend, but because it's your birthday, um, you know, here's a, here's a third piece of cake, go up and, and you can see him. And, uh, and, and she goes up to the attic where Ash is just, you know, he's just kind of standing in the corner. <laughs> it's, creepy, <laughs> it's, a, yeah. it's a very creepy scene. And she says, Hey Ash. Uh, and he turns to the other, Hey, it's, is this the birthday girl? Or he says something. Yeah. Um, and she's like, yeah, are you busy? He's like, no, I wasn't doing anything. <laughs> and, <laughs> I haven't been doing anything for the last 10 years. And, and it's not clear. I mean, it, you know, it, it's not clear that she even knows sort of like what this person is. Um, I just but, assume that she knew that this was like a photograph of her dad in the same way that Ash would go up to the attic. Her mother had put the photo of her bro- his brother up in the attic instead mm. of keeping down in the, in the, next to the fireplace. And his mother wanted to pretend like the brother had never existed, but Ash wanted to mourn the brother. So he would go up and look at the photos in the attic, but that's the, mm. that's the extent of the mourning in that family. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't see that aspect to it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it just, it, that's where the episode ends. It's this, you know, it's again, this is really unsatisfying kind of terrible ending to it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think there's, there's some hope. So she, and again, in visual media, you can't get inside the head of the characters, even if that's possible in, in anything. But um, the the house has been redone. It's different colors. She's got a new haircut, a different color, I think, new, new outfit. And again, mm-hmm. these are superficial phys- physical details. But I think what it's meant to show is she's moved on. She's mm-hmm. not living the same life. And she's got this daughter with whom she seems to be getting along well. So her life has progressed from the stagnation of those early days of the grieving process, Mm. but that the robot is still up there in the attic. Now, I mean, to her credit, he's not down pretending. It's not like she's pretended that he's still alive and it's not like the girl is being raised to think this is actually her dad, Mm -hmm. but that there's the remnant that's still there that, as you say, probably because of that cliff experience, she's never able to get rid of. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) I, I just, I wonder sort of what the daughter thinks that is. Do you know what I mean? Because like, because because it's it's brought up that um, it's a new technology. I think you know Sarah says it's like a prototype yeah. or something. Yeah. So I guess we can't assume that this is ubiquitous in the society. So the daughter. I mean, I just wonder what Martha tells her daughter that this is. Like, is this is she under the assumption that this is a real person up in the attic? Or so, yeah, I don't know. But you know, I think that that your doubts and reservations would be like people in the 19th century who look at us with photos and and home videos and think, oh, those crazy people, they're acting like the ancestors are still alive. That's true. Uh, It's just the next step of photos and videos, you know, holograms, then robots. Yeah, that's a very, that's a very um, kind of disturbing point that you're right. I mean, it's just this weird, I guess we always assume that, uh, it's normal what we're doing now and that the past was sort of more barbaric or whatever, but you know, from they're thinking the exact same things about what we're doing that we'll be thinking about. You know. And then again, I mean, think about like Japanese ancestor worship and you know, this is characteristic of many cultures, but I'm at least vaguely familiar with the Japanese customs where you keep um, statues or masks of your ancestors in, in a room or near a shrine and you regularly commune with your ancestors as if they were still mm. alive. Again, mm. not alive bodily, but as if they're still alive spiritually, believing in, in many instances, presumably, that they actually are. This is like a, a new modern version of that. You keep your ancestors alive and you go up and visit them. You could have a whole gallery of granddad and you know, eventually uh, they're all up there. Yeah. And the, the idea of sort of going to them for advice is very interesting. I could, I could really see that being a... Um, you know, like a very interesting aspect of this where, you know, people always say, you know, I, I sort of relied on my dad. You'll hear people say, or, you know, I, I, yeah. I, 
you know, my grandfather was one of the wisest people I ever met. And it's very tempting if you could sort of capture that and, yeah. um, and use it, you know, for lack of a better word, you know, in your decisions, go up, say, Hey, you know, I got this one job offer here, but I, I don't know if it, you know, it's just, yeah. you could really, it's, that's an interesting. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, what did, how, uh, what difference would it have from, they wrote a journal and you discovered the journal like 30 years after they died and they talked about a similar situation to that and gave their opinion about what someone would do in that circuit. You know, it's, it doesn't seem to me that different. No, it, it doesn't. But I did have this fundamental doubt, um, you know, after viewing it, I, I, I had this sort of question of like, you know, how much would this service actually be able to replicate me or recreate me? And I, I just don't know, you know, because they, they do say that Ash is the perfect user of this or something, but it almost seems like it, it's contingent upon that person um, being, a, you know, giving, giving this wealth of information already to. And Very it's, online. Mm -hmm. And it so, seems like well, the, the less you're that type of person, the less this would work. I agree. And I hadn't noticed that it said Ash was the perfect user mm -hmm. because this fits perfectly with a small detail that it, it took me several viewings to notice that now I'll just build in what you've just said. Despite the fact that he's the perfect user, there's something that it would never capture. And that is that he liked the Bee Gees. Mm. So that first scene where they're driving, that lovely scene of you know them singing and talking, um, he requests a Bee Gees song or sings to a Bee Gees song, and she just says, "What in the world? You don't like the Bee Gees?" And he says, "Have you never heard of headphones?" Which I think communicates privacy. In other words, yeah. he has he has some private tastes and some private thoughts that are never going to end up online, and those might be closer to who he is than anything he ever puts online, such that the online persona will will always miss who he really was yeah and with that too there's another detail she says you know when he first comes down from the bathroom she says you look like him on a good day mm -hmm. um and yeah. he says well you know the photos we tend to keep are flattering so it's again it's this kind of curated yes. uh version of who he is yes yeah and, and i mean that you're right i mean i take that as being a really damning point that without this inner life you know that no one you know, no matter how open you are, there's, you can't, there's no ability, even if you wanted to let everyone in on exactly who you are. People can get really close to knowing, you know, yeah. if you're married for 50 years, I would imagine your wife has to know you very well, Yeah. but she, there's still, she can't be you. Yeah. Um, and, and it just, it goes to show, I, I think, the flaw in the idea of this. And, and I don't think this is a flaw in sort of the way that Brooker set up the, no. the episode. No. I think it's a, it. It, yeah, exactly. I, I think it's a flaw in the idea that anything like this could ever happen um, yeah. or happen yeah. fulfillingly. Yeah. That's what it means. Yeah. Um, yeah, because it's just, um, I, I mean, I asked that question because it, it goes back to, it, you know, as parallels to the other episode where, the, you know, the very person whom this would work best for is the type of person who was already, um, you know, going down that slippery slope of like putting their, their, their persona online. Yeah. Um, and it fails to capture, it's, it's almost paradoxical because it would fail to capture the essence of who someone truly was. And that's exacerbated the less you use that technology, meaning you're, you're more you, you know, like the less you're putting of yourself online and, and getting that kind of feedback from people and, you know, it, you know, kind of shaving down the, the, the rough edges that make you who you are. Yes. It would fail to capture that person the, the most. And that's just a very interesting because, um, yes, because that's the type of person you would maybe want to capture the most. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, this we, gets into the question that I think about all the time, which is, with social media, how can it be used to make you more who you are mm. and not less who you are? I mean, the, I think we, we're all becoming aware if we weren't already of the dangers of social media for distorting who we really are because, you know, they, audiences like certain things. And of course it depends which audience you have, which circles you move in, but you're, you're more or less aware of what people want to hear. And you could start highlighting those features of yourself mm. to get the likes. And that will alienate you from yourself if there is a part of you that's distinct from this, the, what the social circle wants, which who knows, maybe in some cases there isn't, or uh, 
there is, and you have to, you know, cut that part of yourself off or at least neglect it. So I think the dangers are, are, are very clear, at least they're becoming clear. But there are advantages. I, I, I myself, I think, uh, through most of my engagement with social media, have become more myself, sometimes by meeting people that were outside my social circles that who, you know, helped me explore parts of myself that I wouldn't have otherwise, you know, Twitter, I think, is for me at any rate, it's been really good in this respect because it, it it's not like Facebook. It's not sort of self-contained among so-called friends. It's, mm. you know, followers where you really can explode your social uh, circles really quickly if, if that's what you're seeking to do. So I think that, you know, social media has a tremendous potential for helping us become more who we are, but uh, also a, an immense danger for turning us into conformist machines. Yeah. I mean, the, it's, it's, it's weird. It's almost, um, the incentive structures, I, I think when you, when you enter the way you enter, you know, it's this, it's this very steep divide and whichever side you enter on, you are very rapidly going to shift in that direction. It's this yeah, kind of, you know, right this cliff where if you enter with, you know, a lack of self-confidence or, or, or wanting to be accepted and liked by more people, you are just going to just shave off all of those beautiful corners and become this, this, you know, sphere of a person. And if you enter in with the opposite, you know, you want to find out, you know, more about other people and you want to kind of, you know, cross pollinate ideas and, and, and you'll, you'll really become that type of person um, very more so. And it's just, Kind of, it, it goes back to the, the last episode too, where it, it amplifies what you're bringing to it. Yeah, um, right. In the same way that the grain, you know, amplifies what you're looking for. This, this, you know, social media and this extension of it. Um, it just really, it, it amplifies whatever you bring to it, which is, uh, could be very, very dangerous depending on what you're bringing to it. Yeah. You know, if I may, just back to the entire history of you, I wanted to say this earlier and I, I just forgot hmm. that that final scene, which you portray is so dark hmm. where yes, he, he has the grain. He's going through finally some good memories that he has of fee when they got along and, and his apparent daughter at the time. And then he cuts it out and the house hmm which he still lives in has been stripped of all the furniture. I guess she got that in the divorce and somehow also all the color as well. It's just a gray place. Yeah. But I, I take it as hopeful that, you know, instead of, you know, just wallowing in despair in that environment, he's cutting it out. So mm. that past, I and mean, I think for him, especially where his relationship with, with, with the past was this obsessive, jealous relationship. I take him cutting it out to be symbolic of, He's going to move past that relationship with his past, not necessarily into a, a meadow of sunlight future, but at least it's not going to be the same vice that he's shown so far. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Um, and, I, and I think you're right. I, I, maybe the reason why I tended to view it as so dark is, um, is I was focusing on the scene maybe right before that, where he's, you know, he's reviewing the the best times of a, of a relationship yeah. that he just worked so hard to abandon. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but you're right. I mean, I guess his, um, it's weird. It almost, <laughs> you know, it's funny. It, it's almost like that sort of Camusian scene where he shakes his fist at the universe and sort of, um, yeah. you know, he has yeah. this snarky kind of grin as he pushes the boulder, you know, back up. <laughs> and it seems yeah. like he's almost, uh, he's almost sort of doing that thing. You know, he's, he's shaking his fist at the universe. He's pulling out the grain yeah. and you wonder, you know, will, will it be back in, in a couple months? Will it, I yeah. don't know. Will he be rolling that boulder? We don't know. Yeah. And so in that way, it's like the end of nosedive where there's this possibility and, you know, mm -hmm. whether in the end she just ends up indifferent to the, to the other jails, jail, uh, um, the other guy in the jail, whether mm -hmm. she ends up becoming bitter and just wanting to be more conformist so that she can get out, of, who knows? Um, but, it, but it's possibility. I, I think, again, maybe just this is my nature, but in the case of entire history of you, I think that that scene of him cutting it out is meant to recall Halam at the dinner table where she mm -hmm. seems the most mature person there. And she says, yes. I've actually really liked having it out. I think that you know he's gonna jump off the cliff the same way that she did and find out mm -hmm. It's not a cliff, but you know, a meadow. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's interesting that you're right. She does seem to be the, the sort of the most grounded person there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it just, I guess it's kind of a, an indication that, you know, this is what you become. 
this neurotic sort of self-focused, you know, person when you, when you have this. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, but, uh, with the, <laughs> so, so back to, um, uh, to be right back. Sure. Um, I have this, oh, this funny note that it just, it kind of stuck out to me. Um, that, that, you know, there's this theme, uh, of him sort of, you know, re and it goes, it, it goes actually to what we were talking about, the, the shaving down of your rough corners, you know, there's this theme of him kind of readjusting or retuning, uh, the way he behaves or, or, you know, he shuts his eyes during sleep. Uh, he pretends to breathe, um, to kind of fit her liking, which isn't how people really are like that. No, no one's like that. Um, and oh, it's, I don't know. I really, well, well, true. Actually, true. I, I think I know a lot of people like that. Okay. You know what? Fair enough. I, I was thinking, no, no, that's true. You're, you're right. I, I was just thinking of the type of may, maybe I was importing what I would find it, it you know, enjoyable in a relationship. Okay. Though. okay. Um, Oh, but that's, I mean, your, your objection's really funny, actually, because you're right. I mean, there are, it's just, it's, it's kind of the reductio of what a lot of people are doing. You're right already. Um, yeah. Which is well, scary. You know, I, I take a neutral stance to it, at least at first, we'd have to talk about details of particular relationships and so on. But if some people have submissive natures and their pleasure is taken in conforming to somebody else's expectations, then at least I'm willing to entertain the possibility that for them, that is a good relationship. But that raises the question of, do people really have submissive natures or do they just adopt submissive natures as a survival strategy in, in perverse environments? Mm. Yeah, it does raise that. And I guess I kind of tip my card uh, or tip my hat in saying that you know, at least for me, I, I don't think it is like that. Um, mm -hmm. Like when I, I don't know about you, but when I do sort of look at um, situations or environments where I am tempted and, and you know, in the past may pro surely have, you know, shaved down little areas of myself and tried to conform. Yeah. That has never, I mean, not a single time struck me as an optimal environment. It never, you know, never a, a place where you want to remain. It's always a place you kind of want to get through. Uh, and sometimes shaving yourself down makes it easier to get through it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, of course, we, we all have to do that to some extent all the time. Sure, sure, uh, yeah. I mean, so there are perverse environments where we just have to do it too much and we can't be anything like who we really are. Mm. Uh, but then again, there's no environment, no social environment where you can just say whatever you think and do whatever you think and, and people just <laughs> celebrate you for exactly who, all you, who you are with all your rough edges. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah. Um, and, and, but what's interesting is that, you know, this, this, this kind of, you know, compilation of scenes where he's, he is doing that. It does go to show that, I mean, taken to its logical extreme, that isn't sustainable at all. I mean, for the course of 24 hours, she's already sick of it. Um, yeah. where, you know, she's, she's, it, you're, you know, you, you pointed this out already, but there's the paradox where she wants him to do things to Ash might have done or might not have done, but what she wants is that um, almost like inner inner force. I don't want to enact you know aspects yeah. of like libertarian free will, but but she she wants to see that there's something going on inside this body, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, that he's got his own desires. Yeah, exactly. We want to be we want to be in relationships with people, not our projections or fantasies or ideas of people yeah yeah which is which is interesting um yeah. and it, it brings do, up although i'm just a little more <laughs> skeptical about the we because i know couples who function where one person is dominant the other is submissive and they they both seem to like that yeah and i guess i'm i'm not questioning that i i have no doubt that that's you know perfectly perfectly fitting for for some people it just depends on your core because it's just um i don't know may, may, maybe i'm skeptical of us often being on the wrong side of the balance of that mm -hmm. i'm not sure um i'm not sure but it it, it sort of brings up um like i i, I had a, another note that it brings up uh you know aspects of uh of nozick's experience machine where um you know we kind of want what happens and it's this this problem that martha confronts to be real you know um so so nozick's thought experiment for people who may not know it is he he offers you this um this choice you know if you say uh would you get into this experience machine and it will you know you spend the rest of your life in it but what it'll do is it it gives you 
whatever you want to happen. It lays out your perfect life for you and you get to define that. So if you want to experience, you know, training to run an ultra marathon and then doing it, it'll, it doesn't just drop you into the ultra marathon. It gives you the training and it gives you everything. It mm -hmm. gives you exactly what you want your life to be. But of course, in reality, you're laying on a, a bed hooked up to electrodes and none of it's actually happening. Mm -hmm. You're just thinking it does. Um, but, but, you know, uh, I think, I think, you know, someone like Thomas Nagel objects to this and, and he says, you know, when things are bad for us, it's, it's not bad in light of the fact that we discover that they've happened. It's bad for us because they've happened. Um, you know, so like if I, if I, get into a PhD program and I have this incredible, you know, five to seven year experience. And, you know, I, I make friends and I, you know, fall in love and write papers and go to you know, like seminars and, and secure a job and do all these things and, you know, struggle through all these things that I want to do. And then after that experience, some, I find out that it was all orchestrated. Like it was kind of a Truman show experience mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. seems to ruin it completely. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's the same thing with what Martha's experiencing with, um, with, with Ash and, and Ash's sort of reanimated body where that night with the wine, you know, she gets these glimpses of like doing these things and, you know, they, they have this great night together. And then she wakes up and she kind of realized it was all a little bit of the experience machine, you know, none of it was real for him at least, yeah. which is, which is interesting. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't know the uh, literature on that thought experiment like you do, so I may be just repeating objections that people make, but my first thought is that people, or at least I, want a real experience, and I, I actually think simply because it's real, but mm -hmm. if, if some further explanation is needed for why I want reality and not the projection of my fantasies, I guess it's because I have a faith that reality is always more interesting than my fantasies. Mm. So in the case you imagined, if I were to wish for the ideal graduate school experience and then was offered the chance to plug in and, and get it, I wouldn't because for all I know, what I really want is actually something quite different. And it, it would only be in a contact with reality where I'm denied that, that initial fantasy that I would discover what I really want. So mm. I just don't think that we're as in touch with our wishes as that thought experiment just builds in as if we were. I think that we yeah. find out what we want through our engagement with reality in the best of circumstances. Yeah. In some circumstances, we never find out, but, uh, or, <laughs> yeah. you know, maybe in the best of circumstances, we, we, we come close to, to getting to it. You know, I think it's a really hard lifetime task to find out what it is that you want. Mm. Yeah, you're right. And I mean, the analog to that in this episode is um, it's almost kind of highlighted by her sister, uh, Naomi's uh, kind of comment about I'm happy you're moving on. You know, she almost robs herself of the maybe she would have moved on, maybe she wouldn't have we don't we don't know but but she robs herself of the ability to find out if yeah. she ever would. Right. Um, right. Yeah, which is for it, that short period. Yes. Sure, sure. Um, I, mean, I guess you would imagine that it, you know, having that, having Ash in her attic may sort of preclude uh, other relationships in the future, depending yeah. on if they find out about it too. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you meet somebody new, the last thing they want is to find out that your ex is up in the attic. Yeah, yeah. There's a, it's instead of bodies in their closet, it's, it's right. <laughs> reanimations up in their attic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Well, uh, I, I mean, I, so I, I had a big list of things that we were going over. Um, that was the end of my list. Is there anything uh, huge sticking out in your mind that we haven't hit about either episode? No, I'm, I'm very happy with our conversation. Yeah, this was, this was really, really interesting um, and a great time. Uh, thank you for doing this. Well, thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Before we go, just um, tell people because you have a, a podcast of your own and, and um, interesting things that you're working on, where can people find out more about that? All right. So, you know, Google my name, Patrick Lee Miller, and, you know, you'll find my departmental profile at Duquesne University, where I'm an associate professor of philosophy. That lists, you know, my online publications. So they're all there. You know, you can find them randomly on Google, but you'll get a list of my publications. And there's also a tab for my recordings, some of which are podcasts like yours, um, one of which is my own podcast called The Living Wisdom Podcast with Patrick Lee Miller. And 
although that project has collapsed for reasons that we won't go into, uh, I had recorded 50 episodes uh, of it, uh, of which at least 25 are online and, and I hope will remain there. And the, that podcast was going through the Black Mirror episodes uh, with the goal of going through them all. But it was primarily an introduction to philosophy. It was using each episode to introduce philosophical ideas and then use the philosophical ideas to talk about the episode. So it was going back and forth between ideas from the history of philosophy and Black Mirror episodes as a way of learning more about them. Mm -hmm. Yep. And to, uh, to my listeners, if you like this show, there's almost a guarantee that you'll like uh, Patrick's. So I'd highly recommend checking it out. Right, um, yeah. So Patrick, thank you again. All right. Bye-bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode as much as I did. Uh, like I said at the top, uh, this was a really fun conversation to have and uh, very grateful for uh, Patrick uh, for joining me. Um, so if you want to check out any of the links uh, that Patrick mentioned about his work or his podcast, I will include those in the description below. Uh, you can also, if you found this uh, podcast useful or if you find my work useful, you can support me at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Myers. You can also support me in non-monetary ways by sharing this show on Twitter or on social media. You can also rate it on Apple Podcasts. You can like this video on YouTube or subscribe to the YouTube or to the RSS feeds, whichever one you're not using. Um, you can discuss it on your own show uh, and then link back to this one. And you can connect with me uh, to recommend guests or topics to cover. Uh, you can contact me at Plato's Cave Podcast at gmail.com. And you can follow me on Twitter at Jordan underscore C underscore Myers. And as always, um, the links to these uh, uh, posts will be in the description below. And of course, thanks for listening and keep struggling to escape the cave. Plato's Cave is produced by Muckraker Media. You can find out more at muckrakermedia.org.